Welcome back, everyone. This is part two of the Georgia OBGYN Society's 70th Annual Educational Meeting. For those of you who have attended the last two episodes of our lunchtime lecture series, welcome back. We hope you found them to be educational and informative. If you weren't able to join us, I'd love to remind you that all of our annual meeting lectures, our lunchtime lecture series, and today's lecture are available for on-demand viewing anytime on the GOGS YouTube channel. Today's lecture will be brought to us by the esteemed Dr. Haywood Brown, and it's entitled Enhancing Care in Obstetrics and Gynecology Through Telemedicine. It's certainly a timely and informative uh, topic. We've been leading up to telemedicine over the last several years in terms of trying to improve access of care, and we certainly jumped in head first during COVID. Now's the time to refine it, and I'm hoping to hear so much from Dr. Brown today about this topic. I'm going to pause here for a few uh, business items. First, please take a moment to make sure your microphones are muted during the talk. I'll make sure that everybody gets a chance to ask a question at the end if you have one, but just mute during the talk, please. Just like in our part one meeting, you'll utilize the GOGS meeting app as a helpful meeting navigation tool. On that app, you'll find all the details of our lunchtime lecture series, including our Zoom links for each session, exhibitor, and sponsor content. The app is also where you will find your CME certificate and instructions on how to apply for CME. Remember that you won't be able to apply for CME for this part two lecture series until we have completed all of our lectures. And that will be after November 16th. <clears throat> if you've not yet downloaded the meeting app, you can do so at app.resultsathand.com. During the meeting, we encourage everybody to introduce themselves to their colleagues using the chat feature. At the completion of our talk today, there'll be a five minute question and answer period during which way you may uh, participate in two ways. The first, you can use the raise your hand application down that you see at the chat box. Once recognized, make sure when you're asking your question to give your full name. And we ask that you keep your questions brief. Conversely, you can use the chat feature and just enter your question through the chat box. Please include your email information in case we have questions that exceed our five minute period of time. We wanna assure that everybody's questions get answered by giving us your email. We'll make sure to do that within the next week. Again, today's lecture is being recorded and will be offered on demand for CME credit through February 19th on our meeting app. If you didn't get a chance to attend all of today's lectures, or if you had to step out for a moment and wanna rewatch this lecture, you can view it at your leisure. With that, I'm very pleased to welcome back Dr. Haywood Brown to speak to us today. I strongly encourage anyone who missed his first lecture on health equity to please go back and view it. Um, I appreciated it so very much, Dr. Brown. By way of introduction, Dr. Brown received his undergraduate degree from North Carolina Agricultural and Technical State University and his medical degree from Wake Forest University School of Medicine. He completed his residency in obstetrics and gynecology at the University of Tennessee Center for Health Sciences in Knoxville, followed by subspecialty training in maternal fetal medicine at the Emory University School of Medicine Grady Memorial Hospital. <laughs> yes. Dr. Brown has served in numerous, numerous local and national leadership positions. Most importantly, from 2017 to 2018, he served as our 68th president of the American College of Obstetrician and Gynecologists. He was also chair of obstetrics and gynecology at Duke University from 2002 until 2016. Dr. Brown has previously held leadership positions of ch as chair of council of resident education in obstetrics and gynecology, or better known to us as CREOG, yep. the board of directors for the Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine and past president of SMFM. He's past president of the American Gynecological Obstetrical Society 
and past obstetrics and gynecology section chair for the National Medical Association. Dr. Brown's leadership includes National Institutes of Health, DC Initiative on Infant Mortality, and the HSRA Perinatal and Patient Safety Collaboration. Dr. Brown currently serves as Vice President of Institutional Equity at the Office of Diversity, Inclusion, and Equal Opportunity, as well as the Associate Dean of Diversity at the Morsani College of Medicine at the University of South Florida. In April of 2021, he was named Senior Associate Vice President of Academic Affairs at USF, USF Health and Vice Dean of Faculty Affairs for the USF Health Morrison College of Medicine. <laughs> I'm still working for a living, sadly. <laughs> he is doing a lot of things down there in Florida. Uh, among them, I'm sure he's sweating. But lastly, and near and dear to our heart, he was the inaugural speaker for the Luella Klein Lectureship this August at our clinical meeting. And we are so appreciative to have had him for that position and to have him back today. So join me in giving a very warm we welcome to Dr. Brown as he brings us his lecture. Thank you, can you see these slides? Yes, sir. All right, well, I'm gonna put us on slideshow. But first of all, again, thanks again for having me. I feel like I'm a member of the Georgia section because I attended so many meetings. And, you know, of course, uh, Dr. Klein was my mentor uh, at uh, Emory Grady. We went to clinic together. And she would have been one of my escorts if uh, she had been uh, able uh, when I was uh, inaugurated as president of ACOG. So what I want to do today and is really kind of uh, talk to you about one of the other initiatives that I actually had at ACOG. And that really was about uh, telemedicine. Uh, Dr. Ben Cheek, in fact, served on my task force uh, for telehealth. And how timely it was to have completed the postpartum and the telemedicine presidential initiatives. Uh, in, in, and, you know, obviously we didn't know COVID was coming, but how we were able to utilize telemedicine uh, in, uh, in the COVID era for OB care, for postpartum care, uh, for follow-up care was really very powerful and how we can also use it for genetics and for many different things in women's health is very important. Uh, my colleague, Ann Patterson, who was actually my co-fellow at, at Emory, has done a lot of work in Georgia on telemedicine. And I know that she has shared a lot of that with you all as well. So today uh, we're gonna move through this. And here are the objectives which are so important uh, to your CME. I'm gonna talk about telemedicine and uh, telehealth for outpatient and inpatient care coordination. Notice care coordination and collaboration. And I'm gonna give some specific examples of how we've done this in other parts. I'm gonna discuss some best practice models for telemedicine and women's health, including pregnancy and postpartum. And then I'm gonna address some barriers. Uh, I uh, serve on a number of different committees. As you know, um, many of your sponsors, in fact, are individuals I've worked with. I'm currently the uh, medical director for expanded carrier, uh, genetic carrier screening. But one of the things that I'm also doing, which George is a partner in, is our new uh, HRSA AIM postpartum community care initiative that's geared toward decreasing uh, maternal morbidity and mortality. So what is it? Uh, this is gonna be very brief. We're using digital information and communication technologies, computers, mobile devices to manage health and well-being. And I tell you, the mobile devices have really just revolutionized the way that we can do various types of things uh, with regard to uh, follow-up. Uh, you know, everybody has a smartphone. And in fact, I'm gonna share with you how examples of this in psychiatry for postpartum depression have really been very, very uh, productive for us, especially during the area, era of COVID where we're following up women with postpartum depression and able to use their smartphones. It's also called e-health or mobile health. Uh, there are all kinds of services available in telehealth, as you know. So when we went into COVID here, uh, we were able to massively increase the platforms, particularly for dermatology and psychiatry and telemedicine. We, we likely will not go back. We've also been able to address a lot of this for our postpartum care, particularly when access to care and things like that are so relevant. You know, 
it really is limited by the use of the technology to facilitate the clinical care at a distance. And one of the things that you all, have, we've been hearing in the infrastructure plan, which I'm so excited about, is the fact that we will improve connectivity. Keep in mind that 50% of all counties do not have a practice in OBGYN in the United States, 50%. And more than half of all women who are pregnant have to travel at least 30 minutes or more to the nearest delivery hospital. And so we really do need to do even a better job with telemedicine and coordinating care between healthcare facilities and, and outpatient facilities and so forth. And one of the things I get excited about is although 50% of all practices in community health centers don't have a practice in OBGYN, almost 99% of them have a women's health nurse practitioner who's helping to provide the care. And so I see the nurse practitioners as a serious, serious uh, partner as we try to deliver more comprehensive women's care, postpartum care, pregnancy-related care. So the W Health Organization, which we, we certainly, the WHO, has used this definition more broadly, the delivery of healthcare services, where distance is a critical factor. And notice what I just said, 50% of all counties in the United States don't have a practice in OBGYN. 30% of all pregnant women have to travel at least 30 minutes to the nearest 50% to the nearest delivery hospital. So if we think about this as a critical factor for all healthcare professionals using information and communication technology, valid exchange of information for diagnosis, for treatment, for prevention of disease, research, evaluation, continuing education, Think about all the providers in the various settings today who could pull up this lecture and be able to kind of see how they could utilize it. So the policy to support WHO health for all strategic global health development, again, all published, uh, all uh, 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 reaffirmed, uh, you know, over the course of the last 20 years or so. So what is the goal? The goal is better care coordination and collaboration. If I'm at a level one facility and I wanna transfer a patient to a level three facility, I have open communication to be able to do that. It clearly is gonna prove quality of care and compliance with care. It's gonna have fewer hospital visits. Think about the readmissions to triage and to uh, for things, and I think about it from the perspective of how we follow up women with preeclampsia, eclampsia, and how they need to be seen, but maybe they don't need to be seen if they can have a telehealth visit. It really it, uh, decreases the number of face-to-face -face office visits and cancellations, and we found this to be tremendously the case, you know, for the for populations who were uh, who were coming in for dermatology in particular because they were afraid to come in. Patients who are doing follow-up on their cancer uh, treatments and so forth, very critical. It clearly improves patient satisfaction and rural access to care and follow-up for medical and surgical post-operative care. I think about it from the perspective of how we can do follow-up wound care uh, with just a picture. You know, when we think about women who are postpartum who've had a cesarean delivery. Inpatient management. I'm gonna share with you my experience with Alvera Health in um, South Dakota and that e-emergency and that OB critical care assessment. <clears throat> so these are the types of telehealth visits and this is just review. You know, there's live video, uh, sort of like we're doing today, uh, stored and forward asynchrony like we do with ultrasound and x-rays. I mean, let's face it, no uh, radiologist is doing anything anymore other than to tell a, uh, telehealth as they're reading and so forth from home. Remote patient monitoring. This has been amazing for following up of blood pressures. And I have some data on that. And then mobile health, you know, public health practices, education. The things about being that I've uh, talked about with ACOG, we need to begin to put all of our patient education uh, videos and vignettes so that it can be accessed mobily by our patients 
So if you think about this, if you're coming in and you have abnormal bleeding and you want to review certain types of things before you come in to do whatever you need to do, this can all be done on smartphones just before you even get to the office. So an e-visit can save the patient and their doctor's time compared to a face-to-face -face visit. I think about today as I have to go downtown now and park at the medical school building where I don't have parking and I got to pay about, you know, I'm, I'm not cheap, but $7 is still a lot to pay to park for an hour, you know, whereas I, you know, uh, maybe I should be doing the medicine, doing it on telemedicine, <laughs> doing the talk this way. But the reality is, Think about this for the patient as a, I remember my patients at Duke who used to have to drive up six floors to the parking elevator, they're high risk, then they had to go down, get an elevator and then come to, to the clinic. And by the time they got to the clinic with their twins, they were tired, they were stressed and so forth and so on. It's especially helpful for people in rural areas and those who do not have access to transportation, which is think about that. I think we sometimes think about the fact that if you are, you are practicing in a rural center, where uh, there's only one car in the family and someone has to drive to the clinic. They have to take off from work. Uh, maybe, uh, you know, this becomes a challenge. And so telehealth really does uh, help in those domains, especially when you think about how we deliver care now obstetrically. If we're doing global care, you know, the reality is the number of visits and so forth are really a matter of whether they are gonna be paid for uh, through the global aspects anyway, and I think that is a fortunate. How can psychiatrists stay ahead of the curve? They've done this for years. Telemedicine has been able to do this. It's been around uh, since about 1960. And in 1964, the Nebraska Psych Psychiatric Institute received a grant from the uh, National Institute of Mental Health to link this. Now, it's interesting how much the National Institute of Mental Health has just broadened their aspects on telehealth for them. And I'm hoping that we, uh, with uh, the, the uh, NICHD, will begin to kind of put more proposals out there for telemedicine for women's health, OBGYN in particular. So this is one of the first papers on that. And their whole objective is what? The same thing we are, to improve the accessibility of rural and remote health and other providers to specialists. Think about our, um, uh, our subspecialists and how we are doing uh, maternal fetal medicine now. So one of the things that the new president of ACOG, Dr. Marty Tucker is doing, he's trying to improve access to maternal fetal medicine consults in uh, the Indian Health Service, working with the midwives, working with the pr practitioners there where you can do these consults with the objective of something that we're going to talk about now. And that is, uh, you know, the whole, idea of levels of care, transferring care. And we're gonna talk about that. That's just another telemedicine platform. To evaluate the effectiveness of telehealth as a strategy for providing a broad range of services. That's what they did. And this is what we are right now. Video. One of the things that I'm finding is very helpful. And I remember even in my clinic, uh, you know, years ago, the patient, the, the, the referring doctors are uh, faxing in their blood sugars from their patients and you're sitting there reviewing them. Now all of this can be done remotely, you know, with the patient. She can download her materials there. You can review them before they actually do the either office visit or telehealth visit. And it's amazingly uh, good for postpartum care. Think about that group of individuals now who have been gestationally diabetic and you wanna screen them for diabetes. Now they don't necessarily want it. They may not come in for that 75 gram glucose load, but the reality is they have a meter and they can actually do that fasting blood sugar from home, send that to you. You can look at it and you can make decisions based on that and so forth and so on and make those appropriate referrals. So using the same app to estimate based on diet and exercise levels, how much insulin you need. This is what our internist colleagues are doing now for their diabetics. And we need to also expand this for gestational diabetes as well as uh, for a follow-up. Very, very important. Text messaging helps. So this is the HRSA funded uh, telehealth Indian health service grant that I was working with in South Dakota. And they use 12 counties in rural South Dakota. The site visit uh, to referring physicians to ensure patients are properly referred. 
and messaging by marketing and introduction and updates. The process for referral, if it was the patient who failed two of the three oral glucose tolerance a test during pregnancy, they phoned it in and they were able to improve quality care in, uh, in areas that were hundreds of miles away, you know, using this grant. And so this is what I'm talking about now with the NIH and with HRSA and federally funded programs. And you need to think about these things in Georgia and every other state uh, for enhancing care for what is a very rural state, as you know, uh, when we begin to talk about women's health. Now, this was a remote blood pressure monitoring study. We know how important this is now for following up patients with preeclampsia. This was 90 cents hypertensive patients who were randomized to either seeing uh, doing wireless blood pressure monitoring with additional support to mobile apps and websites and standards. So this is actually how it helped to improve follow-up for medication and postpartum care. They also did this for smoking cessation. Think about the encouragement you can give a patient for smoking cessation. And so the reality is that these are type of things that are being done. And now we're gathering more and more data on this in postpartum women uh, so that we can begin to kind of show how we improve their outcomes. This has been done actually for one of the groups at Penn and the maternal fetal medicine group there. Well, this has kind of been around for a long time. Text for Baby is right out of the CDC in Atlanta, where you message information on alcohol, tobacco cessation, and so forth, and prenatal vitamins, and seeking prenatal care. And at a time that this was published years ago, over 700,000 women participated in the program, which is a CDC-sponsored program that found the program does change attitudes and beliefs. Higher levels of text messaging exposure predicted lower self-reported alcohol use, uh, uh, postpartum, et cetera, et cetera. So these are things that have been at our armamentarium and how our many of our public health clinics and federal qualified health center clinics have used this for, for years. But the other thing that I think is important here, it really allows patient empowerment, some kind of dictation of their own health. So text for baby, found that 40% of their enrollees were from underserved zip codes, 82% from households where the yearly income was less than $20,000. Now we know that maternal health and infant health is very much tied to low income. If a woman uh, makes, uh, if a family is less than $25,000 a year, they're less, they're more likely to have a maternal morbidity or mortality event. Barriers, you know, greater than eight text messages a day, utilizing shared phones, et cetera, et cetera. But this is something that they've even uh, taken on in Russia and so forth and so on with regard to those types of programs. Now about in my presidency, actually 2016, in my year before I became president, I was part of the quality and safety stuff at ACOG and we visited Avera Health, which is eCare in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. And this Avera Health, like HCA and many other organizations, was, you know, had expanded all over the state. That eCare, this is their remote monitoring EICU, EICU. They had ICUs that it were monitoring not only all over the United States, but also in foreign countries. And think about this. They had a pharmacy there. They had all this type of things. And one of the interesting things that the, how this got started, believe it or not, if you all remember a name of a person named Leona Helmsley, yeah, who knows? Everybody knows her name. She was a big uh, hotel woman in um, uh, in New York. Well, her son was an EMT, and he just happened to love the wilderness. And so he gave the first grant of a several million dollars to start the EICU e-care process because of his EMT work. He said, my God, we can really do great things. And of course, they've expanded this to all over the state. So e-emergencies, e-ICUs, e-obstetrics. Now here is our paper that we actually wrote with Kim, who is a, a part of the Avera Health Sips. And this is our maternal health compact. This was really about transferring using uh, uh, the whole model of transferring patients. So we talked here about a patient. In fact, it was at one of the rural uh, hospitals in South Dakota. And what we did here in that rural and uh, that patient the doctor called in, she was 19 years old. Uh, she was bleeding. 
uh, basically she was managed at that rural site, literally by a family physician who was delivering her by using this system. And then we put in a balloon, she was transferred and she would actually spend some time in the ICU, but she really walked out of the ICU, uh, no hysterectomy, because the only option available to them was to call a general surgeon in to do a hysterectomy in order to save her. And so we wrote this up and it was actually published uh, in the perspective uh, in the uh, New England Journal, but it was from the work that we were doing in South Dakota. Now, that e-care connectivity requirements are significant, and, and I'm not going to go through this to, to a great degree, but it all, actually almost has to be live to some degree. Imagine <coughs> helping someone walk through a back of a balloon. And I'll tell you something about my colleague Kim in South Dakota. Her husband is an emergency room doc, and so he got called one night by uh, a rural, um, uh, uh, an OBGYN who had a set of twins in the emergency room and wanted to deliver twins. And so uh, Jonathan, her husband, he, he called his wife, uh, Kim, and said, uh, Kim, I think we should, I can help her deliver these babies. And she said, you are not an OBGYN. You need to get this lady together and get her transferred here for the delivery of twins. And so she literally, because of the technology being so there, he was about to take on something that he clearly was not capable of doing. And I laugh at that story all the time. She said, I tell you, I had to talk him down. He thinks that I could talk him into doing a twin delivery with someone who's never done a twin delivery in somewhere in rural uh, South Dakota. So it really does kind of sometimes hit you as well. But that's how important the tech, tech connectivity has to be. We have done ultrasound with this for quite a many years and doing ultrasound follow-up uh, with the monitors. Uh, when I, before I left Duke, in fact, we used to do a lot of consults in one of the practices in Pinehurst where the patient would come in for her <coughs> consult and we would be able to do the consult. We'd be able to see her. The technician was there doing the ultrasound. We'd view the ultrasound. We'd give a live uh, follow-up and so forth and so on. And this is exactly the same thing that I'm sure Dr. Uh, Patterson does with things like that. Dedicated rooms, HIFA protection, and so forth and so on is very important. So OB shared care telehealth is really a teleconsultation in the office. And I know that many of you use this for quite some time uh, with uh, this. And one of the things that I'm thinking about now uh, with, um, you know, I'm doing a lot of uh, discussions right now on cancer screening. And imagine if we're able to get a, um, an HPV uh, self-collection, get that in. Easy way to do follow-up for that patient to discuss that, for that cervical cancer screen would be that way. Now, I think you could do that even now. It's already being piloted in certain places, uh, which is very important in places like Africa where cervical uh, cancer is so up, up, and they're doing it with cameras and remote care and so forth and so on. Now, we don't even do fund the heights anymore, but now we certainly do uh, fetal heart tones. Everybody can't you know, monitor certain types of things. But you know, these type of things are very doable. We used to back in the day, oh my God, the person was faxing in records. I remember being re receiving uh, fetal monitor strips on the fax machine. You all know all that kind of stuff and trying to help the doc in the rural community figure out whether they should do a cesarean delivery or not. Now this is all can be done uh, through uh, more telehealth and telecommunications. So as you know, these were my two presidential initiatives and I'm very proud of the fact that the whole redefining postpartum care and some of the individuals who served on that were really very helpful to me. And so we talked about at least two visits. This has now become the standard of care. Uh, and it's one of the things that I think will stand the test of time. I also talk about unbundling. We haven't quite gotten to that yet, but I think we're gonna ultimately need to do that because what's more valuable in the follow-up, if we were unbundled, we're gonna be able to pay for this uh, postpartum visit a little bit more effectively. As we extend Medicaid to 12 months postpartum, those patients who are hypertensive and diabetic, who are overweight, obviously will be able to get those referrals and those consultations in a billable fashion. Enhanced technology for community of clinical care and education. It really does augment the whole fragmented model of prenatal and interpartum and postpartum care. You think about what we do now, you think about the way it is. You know, we're in group practices. I used to tell people at Duke, I was in a 60 person group practice, 32 residents, 
four or five fellows, God knows how many other people. And you know, you think about it, the patient was likely, the likelihood of the patient being able to be seen by the same person who was seeing them prenatally who was gonna deliver was slim to none. But think about now that we have a lot of hospitalist programs as well. And so the reality, the person who works uh, as the, uh, the laborers is probably not doing a lot of interpartum care and so forth and so on. And so a, a, a preemptive care. So this is another way for us to kind of augment that system. It's critical to full implementations of levels of care. The good news is that JCO has now gone to establish levels of care as a monitoring tool. And so the idea of the, the tertiary care partner really talking with that rural level one or level two partner is going to be very important for being able to facilitate care, improves quality, improves safety, and care delivery in rural access fertilities. This whole e-obstetric model, someone helping you to put in a balloon or someone helping you to do this, where they literally set up the operating room in such a way you can do certain types of things. Genetic counseling for cancer, for prenatal, all those type of things can be done on telemedicine. And we've shown that we've been able to do that during COVID. We haven't had these patients come to our office. All we need to do is be able to bill for it. And I think that because some of the billing got kicked up, I hope it would never go away. Improves patient and provider education to the benefit of our specialty and our subspecialty. So this was levels of care. And I'm not going to go into great details. You already know what it is. It really is about facilitating maternal care uh, across different levels of hospital. Uh, it's a system support where women deliver facilities more appropriate for their risks. You all know how many preeclampsic with severe features that you get transferred in from now who are already seizing and so forth and so on. And uh, that really becomes a very important thing for us to be able to talk to these individuals and get the patient uh, transferred appropriately. Patients with previous should be at certain places. We know that. They should not be at places with only 10 units of blood in the blood bank. And so this is what the process is all about. You know, Texas actually uh, really uh, made this part of their reality. And now it's going to be even more of a reality with the Joint Commission. So this is, uh, this is AIM. You all know AIM. You all are AIM state. And the main thing I want to say is postpartum transition to the postpartum care is what's now happening with AIM. One of my biggest concerns with AIM was <clears throat> how do we do discharge planning so that the person makes that postpartum visit? So now that's all going to be put in the algorithm, such as that transition to care, to what we're trying to do with the postpartum community care initiative is going to be standardized. Patients are going to know when our appointment is, know where she's going, where she's going to go, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And all of those type of things, if she's coming back to your office, she could be given that date of that visit, you know, at her 36 week uh, visit around her due date because it needs to occur within three weeks of her due date. In reality, that's so easy to do. And if she's normal, it could literally be done, you know, with a, a telemedicine platform with her avatar. Because what we want to know is how her breastfeeding is going, whether she's depressed, all of those types of things. So these are all the safety bundles that we now know. You, Jayco, you have to now have a hypertensive bundle. Uh, you have to have a hemorrhage bundle. We've always had the safe reduction bundle. And we also combine the disparity bundle with all of these bundles uh, for all hospitals to use. So this is what my most interesting focus is. This is a program that was out of Wisconsin that was doing postpartum depression follow-up with a psychiatrist. Imagine partnering with your, your psychiatrist or your social worker in such a way that you can do this type of follow-up particularly if the person is from a rural community. This program, they went through a patient like this with us, 22 years old, anxiety, depression, stopped taking her medicines, why she shouldn't have, when she learned that she was pregnant and now she had increased anxiety. She was seen by a midwife in the public health clinic say, well, why is she off her medicine? Well, we don't know why she's off her medicine. We need to get her back on medicine and these type of things can be done. This was supported by a grant, but again, these type of things can be easily supported with the partnerships that we create between OBGYNs and those providers in those communities. Now, 
10 million women in the United States live in rural counties where obstetricians are scarce and pregnant people often must travel significant distances. So this study found that rural patients had a 9% greater likelihood of severe morbidities. We have workforce problems, we have transportation barriers, we have an opiate epidemic, we have limited access to specialty care, bam. That's telehealth. That's what we ought to be doing. And we can do it from the privacy of our own office. This is Baby Scripts. Uh, I was just in a meeting with them this morning. Uh, they are a remote prenatal uh, care firm. This is Anish Sebastian, one of the founders. And this is now a multi-million dollar operation. They have uh, contracts with United Healthcare in 27 states, uh, which is uh, Medicaid managed care in order to kind of tick this to the level that we need it. Six prenatal visits in the office, six from home, weight, blood pressure, et cetera, et cetera. All of the type of things that they needed to do. And so I'm very proud of their accomplishments in about six years. And of course, this is just some information that were written up in Forbes magazine and it's just taken off. And so uh, we actually put a program into place for diabetics uh, at Cone Health, which is Novant in uh, North Carolina, where they were actually doing this. And we're able to monitor all those diabetics uh, in that program remotely with this program. Again, this just shows you what type of technology is already out there. This is telehealth and obstetrics and postpartum in response to COVID-19. We were able to provide a range of obstetric services that had been implemented using telehealth by hand, a handful of medical centers. In prenatal period, these included the use of video conferences to replace inpatient visits, implementing home monitoring, uh, not home uh, contraction monitoring, but monitoring of blood sugars. We did a lot of fetal medicine, maternal fetal medicine consultations. And in the postpartum period, I can tell you what we've already done, including access to lactation consultants, which is something we really found to be very, very uh, effective. The limitations, as you know, this is something that Dr. Cheek is aware of that we actually wrote, we went through with uh, when he was on the task force with me. Only 19 state Medicaid programs reimbursed for telemedicine services delivered to patients in their homes, which limited opportunities to expand telemedicine. So now that we're seeing more extensive uh, extensions of Medicaid, hopefully this is going to change. It hasn't changed that much as of February 2021. But with COVID, it actually got kicked up a notch because more Medicaids did reimburse. And I'd be interested in y'all's experience with that in Georgia. This is kind of something that I'm interested in. This is uh, the underrepresentation of breastfeeding uh, by maternal age and race. And so we know of two programs that have been very effective. Uh, this is about breastfeeding disparity the number of apps that our patients already access. So infant feeding and childhood cognitive by age three to seven. I'm actually involved in another federal program called Reading to Your Kids in the Zero to Three program, where we're actually talking about these type of things to improve their overall health. As you know, these are very important. Uh, this is a uh, uh, Chimera um, 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 Bugs uh, y, uh, program uh, George Bug, one of our neonatologists that we all trained with at, at, at Grady. Uh, this is that program with lactation counseling and follow-up using telemedicine, using FaceTime lactation consultants, and improving disparity in breastfeeding continuation postpartum. So the breastfeeding disparity was really geared at uh, um, African-American women, uh, and it significantly reduced you know, their, their, their rates of uh, of not being able to breastfeed, very powerful program. And I've spoken at her conference a couple of years. These are some of the limitations. You have to have a license. Uh, there are laws that are federal and state, as you all know. There are hospital regulations, there are FDA regulations, and there is same risk of lawsuits if you mismanage a person than it is otherwise. It is important for the physician-patient relationship, uh, physician, patient relationships is generally formed uh, either in the office or through telemedicine. It's exactly the same. Duty to care for the patient. Where is the medicine being practiced? You can have a telemedicine license across several states if you're providing consultations in the states 
Where's the practitioner license? Is the physical contact required? Where is the standard of care applied? All of those things are very important. These are the licensing rules applied to all healthcare providers, those that practice telemedicine within a state on the stakes across lines. I mentioned Avera Health because they are bordered now by, uh, by Iowa, by uh, South North Dakota, uh, by Minnesota, by all of those different states. And many of their providers have licensing, uh, uh, interstate compact license, which is what you get for limited telemedicine uh, consultation. You must be licensed in the state where the hospital or the patient care are located. Usually the practitioner must undergo full credentialing. Some hospitals accept reciprocity and is usually not required for clinic consults. You know, for instance, telestroke programs have been around for years uh, in uh, emergency rooms. Fully licensed in the state where the patient is located. So liability insurance issues are involved. You get the same abandonment issues. You get coverage and you get pricing by insurance. And of course, these are the type of things that have been really kicked up a notch now, as I said, with the whole um, uh, COVID. Blue Cross and Blue Shield, Jim Martin, God bless his soul, uh, really uh, went into a Blue Cross program in Mississippi that was geared toward uh, the state health plan. This program is actually still um, uh, in place. Uh, the MDs, the DOs, the nurse practitioners, the PAs uh, were able to deliver healthcare services at real time consultation between two telemedicine network providers. And of course, the other aspect is the patient must have been present during the consultation and whether that's being videoed or not now, all of these things have been, the rules have been expanded. So transmission of data, this is medical information. It's HIPAA protected. The patient is not present when the materials or records are reviewed. You know, this includes images, ultrasounds, EKGs, labs, I mean, how many of you are on effort these days? I mean, good Lord, I go in and I do my visit. I pull up my stuff. I read my lab say, oh my God, I need to get myself together here. You know, and unfortunately the patient's reading this sometimes before we get a chance to talk to them. And that's part of the problem. And I think that's something that we need to be concerned about. So the physician patient relationship and the liability components, you all are all familiar with. They're exactly the same. And I see Dr. Cheek up there and he knows because he helped write some of this for us, <laughs> for the task force. And in reality, they're all very important due to the care for the patient. Where's the medicine practice? Where's the practitioner license? Is physical contact required? Is the standard of care applied? The physician patient relationship is exactly the same. So here's where we are. Innovation in healthcare delivery evolved and has really taken off during COVID. Teleconsultations for inpatient and outpatient. I think this is the way to do preoperative assessment. We keep in mind, we used to kind of bring the patient into the office. We did all these things. I mean, you're thinking about a patient you're gonna to have to do, um, you know, you're planning to do a hysterectomy and you know that they've already got all that stuff. This is the classic, other than getting the lab work done the morning of the coming in surgery, this is where you can do all of these type of things in discussing with the patient. Innovation in providing prenatal, postpartum, and GYN follow-up for minor procedures. Obstacles, availability. And that's why I get excited about some of the things that we're talking about with connectivity. Uh, that's very important to us. Others, cost and reimbursement. This is a visit and it needs to be compensated like a visit. And then of course the liability concerns. It's governed by the same physician patient relationships. It must provide transfer of information that is HIPAA compliant. And of course the le licensure, legal credentialing and reimbursement uh, is, uh, is ensures quality and safe healthcare delivery. And what I've included here is the chapter from our clinics of OBGYN that was published on postpartum care. That was a chapter done by myself and uh, Nate DiNicola, who's at GW, and who was also on the task force and published uh, in 2020. So that's there for your reference to read as well. And with that, wow, uh, I'm done. And it's so nice to see all these wonderful familiar faces on the screen. 
I don't know whether you want live questions or whether you want to put them in a chat or what, but uh, it is always nice to see friends. Friends, uh, my Georgia family, you know. And how about those dogs, Cindy and, and Ben Chi? <laughs> How about, How about those dogs? dogs? Yeah. Hey, man. Heck, yeah. Absolutely. Listen, listen they scare oh. me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Chris, how are you, brother? I'm still I trying to pull my I'm still I trying to, to pull scare my brain Alabama. Too, too. I want them to scare <laughs> Alabama. That's why I want them to scare. I want them more than scare them. <laughs> They're going to get their chance. I want to send them packing. But Beat I, them into we submission. Gotta, we got to pull my braids through tonight, though. Oh, yeah, bro. I'm off of that one, too. I tried hard Sunday night. Marty Tucker's a big Braves fan, as you know. He's trying to figure out how he can go to get, how, you know, he said, he said, well, I, I asked him if he went to a game. He couldn't go. But the other thing you would know is that um, um, Nabal delivered the shortstop with the Astros. <laughs> so, there you um, go. Bracero. So anyway, it's all good. Anyway, that has nothing to do with anything other than we had to get my football fantasies and baseball fantasy stuff in. <laughs> <laughs> you, got, you got good taste that's okay and, all right and we'll celebrate with you that's we, we're celebrating over here a little early but that's okay. thank you so so much dr brown that was wonderful it's so timely i think you could probably come back once a year and do an update how this field's going to grow and change over the next few years uh you know that i i would love for somebody to sit down and give us the primer on all the nuts and bolts of the laws and yeah. of reimbursement uh i think that's where the crux of of right. everything lies because we're creative and we're energetic and we can figure out ways to utilize this and make it grow but as you very astutely pointed out at the end of your talk is this is a visit we are rendering care. We are using our talents and our time to give care and give care in a, in a great accessible format. And we deserve to be reimbursed. It needs so. to be reimbursed as the same as a, a, as a patient visit. It really does. I mean, there's no reason why it shouldn't. And again, a lot of that picked up during COVID for a lot of different reasons, but not necessarily for us. The dermatologists and the psychiatrists and all those people did great stuff. But think about ours. You know, some of our global billing is really does us a disservice to some degree. Absolutely. And so one of the reasons I'm very excited about what Marty <clears throat> Tucker is trying to do is trying to really uh, get down to that bundle and global billing so that we can, your post part of, your post uh, op visit is part of you, you, you already get paid for it. And I think the reality is that there's so many things that you could be doing uh, if you got in a little additional payment for those type of things, not to mention the fact that uh, I think patients would greatly benefit from it. So we'll see. Absolutely. Uh, right. Anybody with any questions they would like to present to Dr. Brown while we've got him as a captive audience? I just want a face-to-face -face meeting next year. So you all figure out how it's doing because I'm driving up. Well, we're, we're going <laughs> to well, do our best. I mean, well, we're I'm already advertising. I'm we are advertising. whether I'm invited or not. So you may as well decide that I'm going to come. <laughs> you are always invited. You are always, you are a de facto member of the Georgia OBGYN Society. You are and forever will be. So Thank you have a standing invitation. All are right. we 25th or 28th at the Cloister, Dr. Brown? Uh, listen, I, I saw it and I already put it on my calendar. Great. Oh, good. <laughs> we'll see you there. All right. Absolutely. Well, thank you for everybody for thank joining you. us today. And thank you, Dr. Brown, for being with us and, and giving these wonderful talks. We'll look forward to seeing you in August. Uh, for uh, anybody that has any questions that they think of, please feel free to email us. We will Beautiful. bother Dr. Brown just a little bit more and, and email those along to him. I'm going to remind everybody to join us next week for our resident uh, poster presentation. All of our programs here in Georgia will be represented by a resident uh, presenting their poster and their research work. So it will be right back here Tuesday at 1215. I would love for everybody to join us. Please uh, mention it to one more person 
and perhaps we can get a lot of people here rooting them on. Uh, it'll be judged by some very esteemed colleagues. I'm not going to mention them right now, but we'll, uh -huh. we'll talk about it later. Uh, so we will see you then on November the 9th at 1215. And thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brown. And thanks. Everybody. Thank you all so much. I will see Ben Cheek and a few other people at the interim district meeting in Puerto Rico. <laughs> Look forward to it. Hey, thank you. Right, thank you. Take care. Go Braves. Happy, go dogs. Happy Thanksgiving, uh, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. All right. Bye-bye. Thanks.